These are the types of Airbnb deals that you want to be avoiding if you're looking to kickstart your Airbnb business. Now, look, I'm going to be taking you quite a few different things. A lot of them you may not know about. So make sure you're sticking with me until the end because you literally need to know everything I'm about to tell you. Now, look, if you take value from this video, give it a thumbs up. But without further ado, let's get straight into it. Now, look, one thing is worth bearing in mind, and I've seen this time and time again, and it's even happened to myself as well, is that when you're first getting started out in this business, you're super, super eager to get your first deal. And because you're so eager, that may make you want to overdo it when it comes to actually taking your first deal. And sometimes that may look like taking on a deal that's not that good whatsoever you know you're not making that much money from it it's not really in the most ideal location but because you're so eager to get your first deal you may overlook some of those things like for example with myself the first deal i taken on i wouldn't necessarily say it was a bad deal but you know the money that i spent up front was way more than what was really required i'll probably say that i spent three times the amount of money that was needed compared to you know what i would do with it now if i'd taken it on but again because it's your first deal you want it to be super perfect you want to get it to a certain standard which is fine but at the same time you want to be level-headed about it when it comes to the numbers because look you're spending i don't know 10 12 15 grand on a specific deal that's making you thousand pounds a month or whatever the case may be the more you're spending obviously the longer it's going to take for you to get your money back out so this is something we want to bear in mind as well and i think the first danger there is when it comes to doing this is your own eagerness to really want to get your first deal so just make sure you're checking yourself with that and just make sure you're remaining level-headed and make sure you're just focused on the numbers and numbers only and taking emotions out of it completely so look, that's just a quick little side note for you right there but in terms of what we're looking at specifically the deals that I wouldn't personally take on myself are deals that have very slim profit margins. Now, this may sound obvious, but these deals would usually be in the form of much smaller deals. We're talking about studios and also one beds as well. Now, look, when it comes to profit margins, anything that's making you, let's say, for example, five, six hundred pounds, whatever the case may be, something along those lines, are personally, I wouldn't feel as though it's a worthwhile deal. First and foremost, just because, you know, if you're taking on a deal like that and you're having certain months to where the occupancy is quite low for whatever reason, or maybe, you know, you're spending a little bit of money because you have to cover maintenance costs or certain unexpected cost that can literally go from 600 to maybe 200 very very quickly as opposed to let's say for example you were to take on a deal and it's making you let's say a thousand pounds or 1100 pounds a month you deduct let's say for example 400 pounds i mean that's just a random number i'm throwing out there but let's say you're minusing 400 pounds from that that's still six to seven hundred pounds that you're making regardless of you know the unexpected costs that you incurred or maybe the slightly lower occupancy rate that you received for that month so pretty much what i'm saying is you want to go about getting a deal that has a certain amount of profits that you're making ideally a thousand pounds a month or something as close to that as possible so that you're leaving and you've got wiggle room for yourself in case the unexpected happens with some of the things I just described and those things can definitely happen as well so you just want to make sure that you're factoring those things in your mind so that you're making calculated decisions with the types of deals that you go for now look that's not to say that you couldn't necessarily take on studios or one beds because I've got a client that's recently taken on three one beds in a single building and overall that'll be making him around 2,100 pounds in profit per month so that's pretty decent right there you can definitely go about doing that if it's multiple one beds or studios in one building then yes 100% you can go about doing that that's completely different but if it's just you know one studio or one one bed yes technically is it possible for you to take it on yes it is possible passing i wouldn't do it just because of the narrow profit margins and for me it just wouldn't be a worthwhile deal so that's the first types of deals we want to be avoiding. Um, the second types of deals that we want to be avoiding or be very wary of are deals that are in certain apartment buildings that have leases that don't permit short lets. What that means is you'll have a flat in a block of flats and the lease in that block of flats says nobody in this building is allowed to do short lets. Now, this is a very important thing for you to bear in mind because I actually know quite a few people that have taken on deals in those specific blocks. To be fair, they hadn't actually checked initially with the landlord or with the property managers or the building managers and they were doing their thing for a little bit, but then the building managers actually found out what they were doing they got shut down very very quickly there's actually a few people i know um that that's happened to so you want to make sure that uh, you're actually finding out you know either from the landlord or the building manager what is actually on the lease on that building and if it actually permits shortlets what i will say is that you know a lot of apartment buildings out there don't actually allow this and to be fair this is the reason why a lot of people that i know personally focus on taking on houses because with houses you don't actually have that issue because they're freehold properties but with um apartments because they're leasehold you don't actually own the land on that particular property because it's a block of flats that's where you obviously have that issue because you're not in control of what's actually on the lease so make sure you're always double checking that this is super super important and if you come to realize that the lease on that building doesn't actually allow it then it may not be a smart move for you to go about actually taking on that deal because you're just leaving a lot of risk at hand as well because if you invest let's say five or ten thousand pounds into a certain deal and you know you're doing it for a couple of months you're making a bit of money whatever the case may be and then the building managers come and shut you down or you've lost all of that money and you've given so much time and energy literally for nothing so 
that's super, super important for you to bear in mind as well. So that's another type of deal that you want to go about avoiding. The other type of deal that you want to go about avoiding in some instances are deals that don't come with parking. Now look, the key words that I said in some instances, that's not to say that in all instances, you should be avoiding deals that don't come with parking because the vast majority of the deals that I've taken on in the past didn't come with parking. And a lot of these deals were in Canary Wharf, Central London. And because of that, obviously in those types of areas, parking is, you know, a massive, massive issue. And you're just not going to get parking in those areas. But nonetheless, because they're in such prime central locations, the station is literally, you know, not that far away. And there's a lot going on in those types of areas. In those types of areas or similar areas can make it work, you know, without needing to have parking. But let's say, for example, you're taking on a house. Let's say it was out of the way a little bit. Let's say it was, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes away from the town center or the city center. Then yes, in those cases, in most cases, you would need parking for those particular properties right there. Even if it was flats that were away from the town center, city center, again, 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever the case may be, then yes, 100%, you will definitely need parking for those particular properties as well. Now, there are some instances where even if you are away from the town center or city center, you may not need parking. You know, for example, if you're right next door to airport or you're right next door to um, a major construction site that has thousands of contractors working there, then yeah, those are a little bit different, but you know, those are literally specific scenarios right there. Outside of that, we don't want to be taking on those types of properties if they don't come with parking, because you've got to think about it, especially with larger properties. And when I say larger properties, I'm talking at least three bedroom houses. Um, you're usually going to attract families. You're going to attract large groups that are traveling and they need places to stay. Usually families and large groups, they're traveling in cars, they're traveling in, yeah, they're traveling in cars. They're not going to be walking or whatever the case may be, unless they're in, they're in the town center or city center. So this is something that you also want to keep in mind as well when it comes to the types of Airbnb deals that you want to be avoiding as well. Now, the other types of Airbnb deals that we want to be avoiding are properties that are literally very hard to access. What that means is, let's say, for example, you have a flat and let's say this flat is on the sixth floor and let's say inside this building, there's literally no elevator. There's only stairs and your property is on the top floor, on the sixth floor. And the people that are checking in have to literally go over all those flights of stairs to actually get to your property. Aside from the massive inconvenience that's involved with that, because if you were to mention that to someone and they were looking to book your property, a lot of the times they just may not want to do it. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes people wouldn't mind. Personally, I, I wouldn't be one of those people. I can tell you that 100% for sure. But some people may not. By the same time, you're eliminating, you know, a good portion of people that are looking for that convenience and for good reasons as well. So let's say, for example, you get like an elderly couple, an elderly couple that are looking to stay there. Obviously for them, they may find it a struggle to travel, you know, up those flights of stairs as well. Not only that, let's say, for example, you get someone that's in a wheelchair, you get someone that has certain disabilities that restricts how far they can go. Or let's say, for example, people have, you know, a lot of things they're looking to bring. Maybe they're looking to stay there for a week or so or a couple of weeks or maybe a month at a time. And, you know, they've got loads of things that we want to bring. Well, because your apartment's on the sixth floor and there's no elevator, it's going to be a massive inconvenience for them. But not only that as well, that's also going to affect your cleaner's abilities to go about going inside and coming out of that property to actually clean it as well. Because look, you got to think about it. These cleaners, a lot of the times, they may be bringing their own hoovers, their own cleaning materials. And because of that, if they're having to travel, you know, six flights of stairs or whatever the case may be to get to your property, then a lot of them may just not want to do that. So this is something you definitely want to be wary of as well. In fact, I actually had one deal that we were looking at. It was actually in central London. Um, it was a pretty good deal. The location was very, very good. But the, the property itself was on, I think it was on like the fifth floor or something. And there was no elevators in the particular that particular building. And because of that, we just didn't go ahead with it because of the reasons that I mentioned before. So very important for you to know and to understand. Also, the next types of Airbnb deals that you want to be avoiding are deals that have very short contract periods. And these are deals that have six months or even one year contracts as well. Now look, the typical rent to rent deals that you're taking on, the duration of them ideally should be at least three years. Now for some people that may make them feel a little bit scared because they're thinking, oh my gosh, I have to pay the rent for three years. You know, what if I can't get it filled up? What if I have issues and I've got this property with me for three years? Now look, I hear where you're coming from, but at the same time, what you can do to minimize any risks on your part is include something called a break clause. Now what a break clause is, is something that allows you to exit or terminate the contract um, after a certain time period. So let's say for example, you're taking on a property and in the contract itself, you're including a six month break clause. What that means is when six months now comes by, you can now choose to activate your break clause, which will allow you to exit the contract and to give the property back to the landlord itself. So that's a good way for you to go about protecting yourself from any risks that you may be taking. But not only that as well, you have to think about it like this. Let's say for example, you know, you're investing £8,000 into a deal. You know, you're paying the upfront rent, you're paying the deposit, you know, you're furnishing the property, you're doing a better work to it. And overall, you've spent £8,000 on that property. So now let's say that property is making you just a little over um, a thousand pounds, let's say £1,100 a month. So now what that means is you're going to get your money back anywhere between seven to eight months. Now, if you've taken on that property for a year, that simply means that you've only got what, four to five months left to where you can actually make profit. So you did all of that. You spent all of that time. You've given all of that money just for you to make a couple of grand, as opposed to you having a property for, let's say three years 
to where you know it takes you eight months to get your money back out and literally the whole 28 months after that is complete profit that's how you want to be thinking about it you want to be thinking about it when it comes to return on investment and if i'm putting a certain amount of money in how much money am i going to be receiving back out and there's some people out here that take on deals for up to five years that's pretty common there's some companies that do it for way longer as well but trust me three years is a pretty decent time frame especially if you're including a break clause for yourself to go about again minimizing the risk for you just in case that deal doesn't work out so like, i just wanted to come on here and share these things with you hopefully you've taken value from it if you have i super appreciate it if you hit that like button also if you're looking to learn more about how to get started off with airbnb service accommodation and also get started off from property in general this is the channel to be at so make sure you're hitting that subscribe button but without further ado i'll let you go i'll let you do your thing thank you for taking the time to tune in and catch you in the next one